That's right. Interrupting this current neo-coronial cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed. This is Cricketude Busting Episode BTWRLM 3, 8, and 8. Those of you on past cast, broadcast, whatever cast, that'll give you the links to the links I'll send you up when I do the blogcaster. And they're important, especially in the last few months, I've relied on documents that you really need to read if you really intend to help yourself bust out of the prison. But literally, global prison, as you now see it. As I told you, it was going to turn out to be. As you were told here behind the woodshed, it did unfold. And it's going to continue, and very literally, until you you step up and stop it. Or the future that has been planned for every everybody. And this is just astonishing. Globally, folks, this is global. Will unfold in front of you, and you will be maybe maybe not affected. Depends, I guess, on how, whether or not you, you exist long enough. But certainly your future, anybody's future is not going to work out. It's going to be one of uh, no property, and that includes you. And uh, you're seeing, in fact, there's a court case that came out. Everyone's, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's a neat thing. It's actually surprised me. It came from a federal court decision that the court took, a federal court took it, and ended up finding what people think were in their favor. But I want to remind you that if you look carefully in that case, and we'll get to it, at least as a comment, they went through the 14th Amendment. Where, where do I keep pointing you to on the statutes about the 14th Amendment and what your rights is? Your rights are what? Uh, listed over there in Title 42. That's the municipal code as well of the federal government. If you hadn't paid attention all these years and researched it, then you probably didn't know that. Uh, what's it doing out in the country? At any rate, uh, for, uh, Title 42, 1981. And your rights there, your c- civil rights, they say, are to pay exactions of every kind when you get right down to the bottom of it. So, this whole thing is a big extortion, and until and, and you're being you are presumed to be properly extorted against until you you pipe up, and then they put in these obstacles in the way, which some of you who listen to me know, and maybe not listening anymore because you think it's not viable. I've come through the same history. I've been doing this since the 90s, in earnest, understanding a lot better. Before that, another 10 years at least, when I started to be engaging the government that was just like didn't make any sense, but not knowing at all what was going on. And so we come today and I said, well, we better make this example, and there's ways at this whole thing, at least to be that example. And a lot of people won't even want to do that. Now, to my somewhat of a surprise, and I was just put a smile on my face. It doesn't take much, I guess, to put a smile on my face. Someone actually sent me a picture of their letter. It was really vintage uh, technology. It was a blue pen on a notepad paper that was written in b- three blocks on this notepad paper. I'm not talking about the big notepads. I'm talking about the little one. Three blocks of quite of information to set up, like I told you, and a signature and a date to somebody in the government that had the decision. And I just had to smile. I said, that that's it. I'd take that letter to the courts. If I needed to, I would take it to somebody if I set it up b- properly, like making sure I had my return receipts and stuff together. So I have evidence now, if it would, went to court, to impress upon somebody, this is valid. This is an important problem that was now foisted upon us in dereliction of the statutes of the state, even those things. And what am I talking about? I've asked every one of you, if you want to relinquish, you want to relieve yourself of this problem or make the record to be able to, Go to your state statute that shows as a duty to do a determination on the infectious agent that they've claimed uh, causes symptoms that have locked you all completely down. Now, that's the very first one. Then, if you read a little further, you realize even if they had the authority, they've exceeded that authority in their mitigation measures, which can be challenged as well. And so I tried to get everybody into the minimalist opportunity, which is just write the simple letter. And someone sent me their letter, and it just thrilled me to know it. Very, very cool. Didn't take much. It's not the beginning, not the end, but it's a start. And so we'll hope, we'll see what happens on that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to discuss that anymore. There's some uh, interesting uh, obstructions that developed, and we, you'll work through those. And when you get involved, you'll find out how the system protects itself, and you'll find out how empowering yourself, yourself when you learn to encounter those things that they do and actually put more imposition on the officials that are wrong acting. And so it's just a matter of you protecting yourself. No one else is going to do this for you. 
And in that vein, and running this thing through for you know, months and months and months, I mean, I just can't get it. We're hitting, the, the war drums are on the horizon that people are finally doing, understanding what I've been saying about what this thing wasn't, how to prove it, and I think we may actually have the very first court case that actually does the first thing that they're supposed to do, that a lawyer is uh, is writing about, although I haven't read the, read the complaint, haven't had a chance. There's been actually a couple of big complaints. I'm burying myself in helping someone do their own, and so we're focused on, on making sure that's correct. Someone actually came out and sued on the question of whether or not there's a, a test to be able to do this. And so we'll see how this rolls out. I told you a long time ago, months and months and months ago, when this thing started, you're going to be on the right side of history to go after this thing, and it's against, and it's on you. So you have the power, each one of you, to throw off every oppression that you've watched. Now, you may not understand that, and you may not understand how. I'm telling you I see it, and I know how you could, but I'm not... Again, there's no sense to me talking about it just to have you hear me, hear the hear the sound of my voice to say so on how that would be moving through. Now, that said, given there's any air to the complaint that's being put, to, put together, we're going to expose a bit of that. But that's not the point because the case is really are showing without question that the your officials did not comport their activities and actions to the duty imposed by the legislature when a public health crisis exists or purports to exist. And so I'll leave that right there. And along the vein of that, and I've told you, anybody who speaks in COVID is either a, a shill, a doesn't know what they're talking about, or the government, I mean, or the bad actor, the world actor that's trying to take you out. And this little story came up, and I, I have to, I'll take interest in him, but I'm going to hold to my very firm line that there were due process checks in your state that were not done, that the CDC agrees cannot be actually fulfilled. In other words, they would have had to come up with a different way to prove these things out. And the burden's not on you to prove that. They just have to, you just have to call them out because the courts are waiting for you to do so. As we've heard long time ago, and I think it was the Wisconsin case or Michigan case, I don't remember now, but uh, this story came up, very interesting to me, but they did something very interesting as well to me when I saw this, the very first part of this. Uh, on Saturday, we reported, and I think this was uh, Zero Hedge, we reported that Dr. Li Meng Yan, a Chinese virologist, MD, PhD, who fled the country, leaving her job at a prestigious Hong Kong university, appeared last week on British television where she claimed SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes covid was created by a Chinese scientist in a lab. Now, that's pretty sensational. Oh, well, we got proof of the culprit. I'm going to hold real strict to my contention that I've been doing until they can prove correct to the contrary that I'm incorrect, that they did have a duty, that they have fulfilled it. That COVID is nothing, and they haven't shown that SARS-CoV-2 causes it, and they've explained to you all that they don't have a test for SARS-CoV-2, or at least one that's reliable specific to that. And so I looked at this and said, this is a very interesting attack. Now, I don't know where the attack is originating. There's a couple of places that it could be coming from. We have evidence it's a global order. That's the UN. We have it that it could be directly from China as a real attack. As I told you, I talked to watch out for the needle in the haystack. They're, they're going to put a haystack of nonsense in front of your face. Are you going to be able to find the needle of the real cause? And then is that cause going to be a real thing, which is really hurtful that's coming under the cover of something else? And so I'm still waiting for that part. But this is a, an interesting attack. What well, Everyone kind of looks at this and says, oh, we've got a, a GMO. Well, the United States agreed to GMOs when it didn't denounce that the biodiversity convention, and then they moved, pulled all their bioweapons labs together to work interoperably. If you didn't see this kind of, this mesh of control coming. And uh, this came to me as saying, well, she's talking COVID. Uh, Zero Hedge is still on the, uh, is still fake uh, news here, saying that SARS-CoV-2 has caused it. And uh, I'm looking at this as a false story, but it's not a false purpose. It's actually to get people to believe and jump on the fact that it was man-made 
when in fact there's nothing there. And again, the Matrix told us, uh, the little child told us, the, 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 guy, the kid older than his, his looks said there is no spoon. In fact, I think I commented to this in an email. Uh, the, what if there is no spoon here? And that's partly what informs me when we look at the real possibility, the real potential, it's more, more than a possibility, that this is really a, an attack by China, or this is an attack by the United States on its own people in the world, or this is an attack through the mechanisms of the UN. It's still an attack. And I've looked inside the statutes of most of the states that have been brought to me, and I found that there was a check for that, and nobody did it. No official did it. And so they're either part of it, or they're, they're derelict and need to be moved out. But let me move to this. The Chinese virologist, they say that SARS-CoV-2, she says that SARS-CoV-2 was created, and, that's the, and they're saying that that's the cause. That's not been proven. So this looks to me like a fraudulent story to perpetuate the myth that there's a SARS-CoV-2, for which there is no test. And so if we buy into these stories like this, we lend ourselves into a discussion that's not valid, and we lend ourselves into a discussion that that uh, empowers what they're doing and fogs our brain in order to not be able to stand back and say, no, we still need an objective basis for this. Now, wouldn't it take much? It wouldn't take much of anything to convince a military virologist to look like a double agent and to purport to say there's a SARS-CoV-2 to continue the story and the attack from China as well. I'm talking a military attack through the use of a public crisis, public health crisis, which we have defined and I've read to you in the past, is by definition an economic and a societal infringement. Now, there's also that mitigation problem that the officials have in the United States at least. They're only supposed to do so much in order to stop the spread. They're not supposed to extend out. And this is where we get to some of the cases now extending out because they're now apparently enough time has gone on. But let me, I just want to point out, this is a rogue Chinese virologist story who was put, goes onto Twitter, dumps some stuff, Twitter boots her back off. It looked like a pretty cool psyop to me. Why? Because there is no determination that SARS-CoV-2 actually exists. It doesn't exist whether it's wild or made up. We can see evidence that coronaviruses were patented, but we don't see evidence of this thing. We are getting a little bit of a hit that it's not this thing. When Russia made a so-called vaccine that was actually GMO that didn't use coronavirus to cause the same antibody. So this looks like a set-up story. This looks like the furthering of a Chinese attack or the United States attack or the UN attack to try and bring you into belief that there's a SARS-CoV-2, that it was manufactured, and that it's causing anything. So moving on, again, you can leave this open to discussion, but I'm not into that anymore. Um, I don't talk much, actually, to this stuff, even though I talk a lot. I talk a lot here. I'm just trying to explain that there's a different pathway. And the problem for me is really, I start thinking, I immediately jump to the fact, when you covered this whole thing up underneath mere symptoms and fraudulently stated there's SARS-CoV-2, a bunch of people died with comorbidities because you started to focus on that, and that wasn't the health system that we were supposed to have, and that's not what the public health officials were supposed to do. And so really I'm kind of looking at the the effect of this, not really challenging. There, there might be something, but I don't see it. Uh, but but that would be, oh, that should be provable, correct? So why am I saying that there's no test and you can't test it and all this is because of that same document I un uncovered with the help of John Rappaport, who identified the diagnostic panel, which is the instructions from the FDA, where inside, wherein it states quite a few things, but mainly that you can't use this PCR test that they use to identify anything. It's an indeterminate test. It only looks for antibodies or antigens or whatever var variant. Uh, but it says right in the panel, the diagnostic panel, I think it depends on which version. I've got both the... March version, which is on page, I think, 38, in, uh, and then I think the latest version in August or so is on page 39, the statement, since no quantifiable virus isolates of the 2019 NCOV are currently available, assays designed for detection of the 219 NCOV RNA were tested 
with characterized stocks in vitro transcribed full length RNA goes on and on. They have no way to identify this. They they know that. They know that even in the most recent most recent uh, documentation from the FDA. So anybody looking for authoritative information and you think that the FDA is it in totality or the CD in totality, I'd be cautioning you. But inside the truth, uh, inside the lies they're talking is the truth. And you have to be patient to watch for it and be diligent to see it. And so right here we know that there is no test. So how does the the uh, Chinese virologist able to test it. How is anybody be able to, to mess with SARS-CoV-2? Unless it is man-made, or it doesn't exist, and this is all a big psyop. And my, again, I just say, every time I say that, I said, and there's people dying because of this lie, where we're not identifying what it is, and the comorbidities, your cancers, your obesities, your operations, all the stuff that you need to keep yourself moving along in the in a proper way because of your problems in life are being covered over by this COVID nonsense. Anyway, moving on. So here, right there, that's the statement that you're going to bring up, and we have uh, into a into a communication. Whether that's uh, if you want to expand beyond a three paragraph simple three paragraph note uh, to inquire upon the test that you, they did and what how they determined this thing that there's no evidence for. Uh, that that starts the process, or you want to get further where you're actually trying to shut down the, the entire thing, and I'm not just talking here to an injunction. There's a couple of different remedies, and I said each one depends on how you want to come will depend on what, what we bring to it. This statement is critical to do what? It undermines the very thing that the government resides on, that presumption of prerogative that what they do is correct. Because if they're claiming that there's a COVID, that's a cause, that's a lie. If they're claiming there's a cause for COVID, that's a lie. In particular, SARS-CoV-2, where there is no isolates for prime isolates inside the labs in order for them to test against. Where do we hear about the problem of that was the inventor of the PCR test. And this is why I said it's why it's only research. When they know they have a core identity of some isolate, they work with that to magnify it. That's not foolproof either, but it gives the researcher a big, a good idea somehow on what they, on what they're focused on on that side, not in a clinical or diagnostic setting. And the, the other thing about these diagnostic panel instructions that you get on the FDA says it's not really for that. It's not to do these things that they're trying to do. At any rate, the fraud goes on, and that's what you'll be pointing out to do what? Strip the government of the very thing that it's been coming out now, and it came out here in a federal case that we'll get to in a bit. The, the very case that I saw a long time ago that the government would use against everybody as the club to beat you all in the head and to kill you with was the very thing I focused on that I've been telling you to counter. And if you don't, they win. If you do, you open up the can. Now, you have the better potential. And if they fall against that, they got to now make a good record of how they're falling against what you've brought when you tell them they don't have the prerogative, they, they're not entitled to that prerogative. And so this is a key point. This case is coming up. In fact, one of the questions in email brought it up as well. And I, anyway, so we'll keep going here. Here it is. There's no SARS-CoV-2. See, 2019 NCOV RNA is SARS-CoV-2 as they redefined it. Remember, they changed that name. And there's a whole other story about that that invalidates this thing. But, I won't, again, it just depends on how much you want to talk about. I'm kind of wanting to get this thing into a small a package so that we can get we can get it d d delivered uh, and properly so so that it gets uh, a hearing properly we may have a case that might do that i don't know we'll we'll see uh, moving into unusual features of SARS-CoV-2 was an extension of that story where this uh, this virologist has made a report you can read and i just again just the reference to SARS-CoV-2 and the presumption that they did a they've done a positive causation test is, is impossible and so this kind of leads my, my, my discussion, and this is another thing. These are so-called foreign medical experts, so-called. This could very well be a military officer who's so-called defected, who is depositing this nonsense to further the condition, which all players in this are going to use. All governments are going to use this to continue the control that they're actually after. Remember the pivot to China. Don't forget that what Obama said they were doing had nothing to do with the military in the concept of ships. It had to do with the military, but in the concept of moving a control structure in, utilizing the very same things that the governments, the United States government promoted, that every other government promotes, and we put it in the title, sustainability. 
you know, we'll go there too far just to point it out. Now here's what's breaking now. AB8, I guess we can pronounce that as a word abate. COVID-19 drug breakthrough, tiny antibody component completely neutralizes the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Again, there is no test for SARS-CoV-2. They are also talking here of an antibody component. When you read the story, they explain and they admit what they've made in this case from the University of Pittsburgh is a larger molecule. When I read that, I, that my whole, I just said, that's the Russian technology. That's what, remember, that's what Russia did. They took the, what, the Endino virus and they connected some protein spikes on it, GMO style, and they make your body think that it's doing, but it's not really a coronavirus and it's a bigger virus. It's more controllable. It's kind of an inert thing as well. I thought it was, that idea is kind of neat, but I don't know about, again, what are they actually doing to your to your body, and why do you even need it? It doesn't. This thing hasn't been proven to exist. There are no isolates. The FDA already tells you that. CDC agrees with it if you know how to read their stuff. I went through that. I went through the the decoder ring of terms for you. Okay, so this there should be no explanation that we don't uh, we don't understand or that we commingle these terms anymore. I really don't understand why people keep talking COVID when they mean an infectious agent and don't identify don't say infectious agent instead wondering where it, where it went. But so here they're saying that they've been an antibody. When you read carefully, they never use the word vaccine, but they always, they talk about short-term immunity and they have to inject it. This is a vaccine. And so this is done on a case-by-case basis. It sounds like it almost sounds to me, although I don't know the technology, it sounded to me described in words like the Russian so-called vaccine against what? I told you there's a chance. It looks like to me I'd play it off this way. Russia had a big problem. They needed to convince people there was nothing. They couldn't just do it by saying so. Maybe why Trump hasn't done so, which he should, and he should have months ago. I told you about that. So they're going to go ahead and do something they know is not really going to harm anybody and make up, make believe it gives you these antibodies. With the PCR test, will, will test positive and everybody can go uh, rest easy again. And it's completely a useless test. Okay, so... Here they're claiming that Pittsburgh now has an antibody breakthrough that sounds just like the, at least in words, the Russian uh, by, uh, vaccine, which they're not talking as a vaccine. So now this new promotion that they're going to promote you into taking a vaccine, they're not even using the word now. They're going to say it's a therapy to help stop short term and uh, give you antibodies. And again, it's the same fraud. They're just going to just show the PCR test is positive and then they can show and then disregard after 14 days. Now, what are they giving you? I don't know. What are you transmitting around? You're now a vector for the shed, aren't you? So this is a big, big deal problem. Uh, they've got us in a, in a bad way. I've told you to hit their authority straight up, that they don't have what they think they have. They can't order anything. you got to find the black and white statutes to do that. And once you do, all this stuff starts to certainly make a record of question. And once they have the question, they haven't fulfilled the burden. Now we're going to push this thing over the edge and we're going to end it. None of you want to do that, or very few have thought about it. So I'm a little concerned. But I'm uh, going to continue broadcasting this. And on, like something like this, CDC COVID test guidelines were watered down despite the internal objections. I found this story fascinating, uh, at least. Uh, but the, they bring up exactly what I've been telling you for months and months. So what you find, you can find that the CDC, it didn't water down. This is outright fraud. This is the problem of this Guardian story. Oh, they watered down these, these internal documents said different than what the CDC promoted. No, this is outright fraud. And here's one of the things that caught my eye. I won't read through all these stories at this point. You can read through it. You can see how these things work. Those of you that are doing the work with this, you will put pull these these references out if they help you, if they prove the uh, support of fact or proof of what you're saying to to eliminate the prerogative that the government has that their experts are anything that their their dictates are are valid. Where you show the statute showed that they had to do different. In this case, this one, the thing that caught my eye was what I've been telling you, internal documents on the matter contained elementary errors, as in quotes. Now remember, if they ever call error or mistake, they're, look, they're evading, actually, the fraud, and they're doing it plausibly, so you have to attack that problem. And this gets a little bit more. If you're going to write more than a letter or things, we have to then get more technical on how they're doing the fraud. These are not, I would not agree these were elementary errors, and we can do that because they know the test that they're talking to won't do, won't show you the cause. And what, what backing up, what witness do we have but that, what is it, the New York Times 
edit the document, uh, the, yeah, the report about the whooping cough. That they've tried the PCR way back when, and that caused the epidemic that wasn't, just like today. And in states that I see people that are commenting, I'd say, wow, that's a pretty interesting report because it's right in the states that people are most commenting about the problem. But internal documents on the matter contained elementary errors, such as referring to testing for COVID-19 as opposed to testing for the coronavirus, which causes it, and recommendations inconsistent with the CDC's stance, the New York, New York Times reported on Thursday, citing a senior CDC scientist. So they admit, they, as I told you, you can't test for, for COVID. The scientists inside were saying, you can't test for COVID. you got to test for the infectious agent. They now tell you it's coronavirus, but that isn't proven, is it? That was a suggestion, if I can give it as much power as hearsay, from a foreign enemy, China. Or that was attributed to China by the United States, who was, remember, they installed Fauci. Don't fall prey to Fauci. And his word in Italian means jaw, so chewing you up. It was all all told to you in, in the names that they haven't proven the cause at all, whether coronavirus or anything. So that's a lie within the scientist. Also within the report exposing that the CDC promotion to you wasn't even consistent with the science behind. What they're trying to do is say that the science was valid. In fact, you can't even agree with that science because they haven't known what causes these symptoms. Okay, so you can still look inside the truth and find the lie. And this is what you, how you start to parse this thing through. There is no objective basis by which they, they go. They, they usually they identify that they did the wrong, and yet they suggest something else that's still not true. At any rate, so move on. If you pay attention, you can you just work this thing right on out to expose the fraud. And you're going to have to because of the way the presumption of power is relative to public health measures. I told you this early, early, early on when they went to medical martial law, when they went to medical imperatives, the society was pressed against the wall and constrained to have to do the laser response, the laser attack sniper shot, because the power that's brought to bear is long-standing. well, it's not really law, but it's long-standing precedent that, that was, has been used to uh, club you like baby seals, and it's still working. So, moving on, a nurse whistleblower, hospitals vaccinating patients by force without their knowledge. And this was now moving into the thing that the mechanisms they're using to move these vaccines through, even if they don't call them that. They call it AB8 to you, and it'll get rid of your COVID if you're a vulnerable class. And everybody ends up being vulnerable if you look at all the people dying around you, uh, around you when they get this thing because their comorbidities are what's being kicked in, into gear by this, by whatever it is. Maybe it's just the, the influenza of the, of the decade that's causing it, but it is it, those parts are happening, but they're being covered over by a fraud and potentially a, an enemy attack from China, an economic and societal attack. Which one do you want to go? It doesn't matter. They're there to be checked by your local duty to make sure, not to rely on the foreign enemy, the foreign medical expert, but the local, on the street, who's dropping dead type problem. Momentum of consciousness and continual discussion on the truth and education relating to vic vic vaccine injury has never been greater. Parents and communities have taken the initiative to find answers. Now, this story is, enters into that way. What this is exposing to you, and you need to really, really get, uh, get past the vaccine thing, uh, what they're doing is they have a program of forced flu vaccines under the color of consent by forms that you fill out. Uh, that is very serious. That you, Everybody really needs to understand this deceptive uh, dynamic that they end up vaccinating you when you feel think you, you you can't read the fine print uh, and you give them this permission a consent underneath this these forms you fill out you give them commit uh, permission to give you any kind of type of treatment that they need they end up put you putting you down let's say for a surgery and they give you a vaccine when you're down and so what my thought here and I'm not going to I don't want to get into legalisms those of you, there's, it depends on the state that you're in, there's a medical directive document that you need to make up here. This is where we're going. To, we all need to know better about what is required. They've put in some states two documents that you'll need in order to be able to maintain, notwithstanding anything that you do, the medical directive, which you would rely upon that instead of filling out forms. And so 
I want to direct your attention. There's a deception going on inside the system. Anybody who goes in for operations and treatments and things will be asked to do these forms, which gives them the consent you think you're denying to them to go ahead and do biogenics, what they call, I should read here, when you go into the hospital, if you need surgery, uh, say you need a knee replacement surgery, first they, they're going to ask you if, you're, you're ha if you've had your vaccines. You're going to say no, and then you're going to say you need to sign this consent if you're going to have surgery. And I've heard a lot of people talk, I'm talking to that are saying, yeah, they can't get their, they can't even get into a doctor unless they agree to this. So that's a different problem. We, we can deal with that if that's what your problem is. I won't talk about it more. I've mentioned a little bit about it. But anyway, on this story, you can be, you can be going to Surrey. You need to sign a consent. In the consent, there's a word called biogenics. Biologics is another word they use. And if you sign the consent saying, I consent for you to give me biogenics or biologics, that basically means that they can give you anything that they deem necessary, including vaccines. So if you say that you didn't get a flu shot and it's flu season and you sign the consent saying, I agree to biogenics or biologics, they will give you a vaccine even when, you, even when you're under anesthesia because you already signed the consent. Now, I'm not going to talk more about it. It's up to everybody to want to do. But this is the insidiousness of that. Remember I talked to you, the multivalent vaccines are why they do that. So when you give your consent, they just go ahead and give you these multivalent vaccines or thing, whatever treatments they decide that they want to give you. And we're, wa we're watching a pretty scary time in the medical profession, and all that's to what do profit, not health. Now, uh, long, so here's I just a warning. You better get your med medical, learn what a medical directive is. And, and there's another document you're supposed to have in those states that require it. And make them up. It's kind of like a will. Nobody does, folks. This is it. This is your will. If you don't do this, they're going to treat you and they're going to put it in. And then the problem is you don't know how you're going to respond. Some may be fine. A lot of people are not. And that's like just rolling the dice that they claim you gave consent under the color of this funny word that you didn't. You just kind of read right over. Yeah, why not? You think that you got to get out of the idea they're doing things for your sake. Right? So... I mean, if they're doing it for free, maybe you might want to push that, but they're not. So, anyway, word to the word to the wise here, folks. This is really a serious story right there. I'm not worried about the vaccine part. It's that you're really not knowing that you're giving over the kind of power to them, and then they take advantage of you when you're out in order to do it. Shows you another method of a criminal mind. Now, I want to move in from that warning into an interesting. Uh, I received an email a couple of weeks ago. Advancing the ideas of information on habeas. And I wasn't on this information for for who I talked to. And, and maybe, well, I don't know, maybe I got a lot of prisoners listening. And maybe I shouldn't be so dismissive. Uh, the, the This was a, a habeas for prisoners. And so I wasn't as interested in it for the people that I'm helping. But as I've said, you read through the information, you might find things in the information that's helpful. In this case, is a, the story update, COVID-19 and state habeas corpus relative to prisoners. So if you know a prisoner and they're underneath this thing, and this is a counter to what I believe, since I've told you, I don't believe COVID, well, COVID's not actionable and it's got no cause. This is, in a way, to my mind, a fraud on the court and the system. If it's ever found out that this is all a fraud on everybody. Now, you might have a good faith reliance and all that. My point is, this really, I looked at this and said, this is kind of interesting about why would, why would I even talk about advancing this? But in a way, the system's unjust. They're playing this out. If you're a prisoner, maybe you should pay attention to this link and go to the blogcaster. I'm not going to read the article. I do find a couple of things in it. What if you considered yourself a prisoner? Quarantiners. Corona quarantiners. You think you're a prisoner? What if you consider this is how I started to approach this? Let's look at this information about habeas. It's saying they're available. First of all, like I've told you, they're saying if you're a prisoner, you can use it. It even says if you're a prisoner, you get to use it for yourself. But what I found interesting is that it's not something that you just willy-nilly apply, and we have some guidance for that. As I read now a couple spots from it, COVID-19 and state habeas in other jurisdictions. A question arose, arose uh, in the second case about how courts in other states have responded to COVID-related challenges uh, to incarceration is violative of the Eighth Amendment and the state constitution prohibitions on uh, cruel and unusual punishment. I need to interject. Eighth Amendment and then state says this is a Fourteenth Amendment matter, not relying on state. So understand to parse out this conversation. 
as well. I do. I don't know if you do, but I do. And it makes a difference on how you're going to approach it if you ever go to to a jurisdiction requiring a particular jurisdiction. As we heard, you don't want to commingle in your complaints these jurisdictions because another judge in another jurisdiction with another standard may grab it up and then you're done, I mean, as far as I can tell, except for this recent case in the federal court, which is very interesting as well. Moving back into the discussion here, this article goes on to say, I looked into this question further. The author didn't apologize for not giving the name. As the rulings of the courts elsewhere may be instructive, courts in at least five states, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Montana, New York, and Washington, have issued opinions on the subject. All five states appear to recognize that a convicted prisoner may appear uh, may obtain early release based on what might be called a COVID-19 habeas claim, although some of the decisions rest in part on state law and procedure, and relief was denied in most cases due to the insufficiency of the petitioner's evidence. This was highly instructive to any of you who pay attention and understand how I've tried to how I've told you how you parse these things in order to understand if there's a door where it is where the handle is how to turn it and how to walk in through their limitation and if you don't feel the feel the field the limitations you won't be able to get past the door this is not much different than talking to the federal court and their threshold problem for standing Right? If you don't have standing, you can't prove it, you can't prove the harm directly, you're not going to open that door. You're not going to meet the threshold matter to enter the court. This is the same thing here. Insufficiency of the petitioner's evidence. For those of you writing your habeas, is, it's not cut and dried. You do have the remedy. You have some burdens, as, even though the burden shifts. Once you make it show, evidentiary, not your opinion, that there was a major failure in this case. Now, moving on down a little bit further, this thing, this passage goes on and says that, that this, uh, these types of cases were denying habeas relief because uh, because prisoners did not establish the conditions of incarceration violated the Eighth Amendment or Massachusetts Declaration of Rights. If I take that as a guidance, and I'm going to interject a couple things here as we move and reading through here, this would be relative to your house and your rights that the, you then turn to the statute that showed that even if the power was within the administrator of the public health uh, crisis, it wasn't within his rights and it was unjust treatment inside your, to put you in your prison cell at all, let alone that it kept there and destroyed your, your society, destroyed your economy. And so if you take guidance on this, you will see how to adapt it to your own house, that if that's a quarantine area or you're on a restriction that they've interfered with substantial fundamental rights, which is implied in this. Okay, so you just treat your house as the punishment, and it's unjust by the black and white that said they they only had they had a limit, and that was to stop the spread of the vi of the infectious agent, and they could only do it if and they could only do it within a constraint of without destroying the society. It's all written down. You just have to restate that. We're going on here, that, that was one thing I found. It was pretty interesting. If you just treat your habeas as you're in the, uh, how, uh, your house is a prison, and what have they taken from you that was unjust? The conditions that you, you live by were interfered with. What are those that were fundamental, that were not wrongly infringed, is what you would put in as a harm. And so this is a guidance on what you would put in, for your essentially for the harm, in order to show there was a unjust punishment already before the fact, essentially. Also denying a personal restraint petition, the state equivalent of a habeas corpus, because among other things, prisoners did not present sufficient evidence of official deliberate indifference in tackling COVID-19. This indicates for me what I've been asking you to do is send a letter to put them on notice and you watch whether they respond or not. And so we can bring up these legal terms into a complaint eventually, or in a consolidation of facts, even if you're still administratively approaching this, to show how they have them show cause, how they aren't deliberately indifferent when this black and white said they were supposed to do this, and then they only hand you uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the cause and there's no test. You go on and on about how that point, the point is that you have an obligation to bring sufficient evidence. Is that your opinion? No, that's an affidavit attached to your petition. And tip, hopefully notarize if you can find one, and or whatever. I don't know how they'd see that. They've interfered with that as well. I'd actually take that as a claim. Uh, your notary is an interesting problem. You can have two witnesses, but they'd have to be in your family, wouldn't they? 
And so you see right off the bat this COVID really interfered with your ability to do remedies, although I don't take those excuses. I would just try to find a notarize, uh, try to even use two witnesses or a notary in order to make an affidavit of your evidence, which is your statement of those harms. Not just your brief, your brief and your complaint don't do that. An attorney's brief does not assert evidence. And so this is a main, a lot of, a lot of people don't understand this. And why, if you look carefully, for those of you who have asked to go to the habeas rules, you'll see an affidavit is attached to your, to that petition. It's not the writ and it's not the complaint, the petition. This is an actual definite difference in the, in the documentation. But now I do something else. I haven't found it to be a violation. I've had it accepted. I make my petition an affidavit as well. It's a double, a double use. And why, and, and I found that to be efficient, especially in a habeas where you're, if you're a prisoner, you don't have a lot of time. You know, you don't have a lot of uh, facilities. So you got to keep it pretty uh, correct. The point is when you walk into court with an affidavit, that beats anybody's petition in response because they don't have bring evidence. They have to bring their own affidavit then. So this is all procedural as well. I keep talking to you. It's not just the words you use. It's anticipating the procedures that are moving through the court to affect the remedy. And then you're dealing with the, the anticipation of a defense, which is probably the most work, actually. These, like I said, the little letter I saw, three little par short paragraphs laying out the case, that was all you actually need. But to anticipate defenses could be quite a bit of work. And it's all because of the they flipped this thing on its head and they've given the government actually too much leeway where the courts did not inquire on their own into whether or not there was actual standing in the state to actually make the claims that they were. I'm saying you do that instead, and you point out that the courts ought to have done it, but they sit, didn't, so we're here today, and this is to stop that as well. Going on here, uh, again, something I wasn't, I want to let you know, I wasn't interested in a way to read more habeas information, but I really don't throw away information when it's presented to me, and I look for what I can use it for. I'm reading despite the fact I don't think I speak to too many prisoners. If I do, I apologize. Maybe you should comment, come, uh, communicate with me. Not that I'm going to give you any legal advice, but for this thing, and it's dangerous, and everyone thinks it is, yeah, go ahead and use it. Here's some guidance for you. And those of the rest of you, I'm not really, I think you're a prisoner in your house, so that's how I treat this anyway. That's what got me to start looking at this, that there are certain standards that both sides have to meet. And if you don't understand that, you're likely going to fail with the presumption that's happened. Moving on, unpublished, denying, unpublished was a reference to denying re re habeas relief and finding petitioner failed to meet his burden after a doctor asserted it was not medically necessary to release the petitioner. And so you anticipate that they would produce a medical expert that kind of shows that these no not going to be, it's not going to be medically necessary. That's an interesting point. How are they locking everybody down and it's not medically necessary in a confined space? They would have had to show something. So it's an opportunity to, well, you first you understand they're going to come. They can win if they assert that. But that anticipate you and now have, it's not a surprise. You'll know that they might come to do this, and you're going to have to have counter evidence, not your opinion, but counter evidence as to the inadequacy or the problem with that medical opinion or, or whatever. Moving on to this last one in this paragraph, finding of harm in the denial, finding of harm of COVID-19 infection entitled prisoners to habeas proceedings, but denying relief because officials had, quote, made substantial efforts to ameliorate the risk of COVID-19 and, quote, petitioners posed a high risk of flight. Another element to look forward to, if you can show that you're not or whatever you want to do for the flight, that eliminates the, that, that condition, that limitation of your getting the habeas. But more importantly, I wanted to focus on the fact that you anticipate that they made substantial efforts to ameliorate uh, a COVID risk. If you asserted that they don't know, that there's something out there and they don't know, and so those, there could be no amelioration, notwithstanding what they said, I think you'd have a better position to say, and if you, now that you know that you've heard that, you would be in a better position. And if your house is a prison now, which I don't say that as a question, actually, it's a rhetorical, rhetorical fact, your house is a prison, they cannot make substantial efforts to ameliorate of COVID. How and why is what you have to develop. And you'll develop it exactly as I've been telling you to develop it over the last months, folks. Okay, so this is, I'm telling you, the, this little document that I wasn't necessarily to, it wasn't giving me more information looked at it in a new way, gave me a lot of ways to talk to you on how you're going to fulfill what your complaints need to do, given the heads up by these court cases.
What's the battlefield? What are you dealing with? What's the dynamic? You have to uh, anticipate all that. I've been here for months to explain a lot of this. And, I can't, again, we can't field everything. And this is why it's, I can't really speak in the general to this stuff specifically. I can speak specifically to a particular thing. And that's essentially what I've been doing with people that uh, would contact me. We look at the dynamic of the locale that you're going to be doing this or what you want to do. Uh, going on next, another place in a paragraph. In one case involving Riker Island Jail, the court released 18 people. Now, this is where they did use the habeas to release. 18 people were released at once, some whom were alleged to have violated parole or were incarcerated pursuant to an underlying conviction. This is setting up my next tab in that statement right there, that even if they're violating an, uh, parole and incarcerated, remember, parole is just your agreement after you've been released. So there's a contract thing there. It's not as powerful, if you will. It's part of an extended part of a sentence. There's a mitigation there. Uh, this is also dealt with not as habeas in some places, but post-conviction relief. Again, it's it pursuant to state law. You start talking federal law at the state level, you'll likely be off point and lose. Okay, so this is a very specific, when I talk to jurisdictions, it's very important to understand where you are. As I've been telling you, you want to maintain, unless you want to go to the federal, you make sure your rights are at the federal, and you speak in the context of them, them violating your rights at the state, but you stick in the federal, or you stick strictly in the state, which I've been advocating here for most people, and uh, I'm still going to advocate that way, despite the latest federal case that found in favor of the state uh, petitioner. Uh, and moving on, find, finding officials were deliberately indifferent, even if acting in good faith and granting habeas relief, finding petitioners established due process violations under New York state law, uh, inciting Brown Plata versus Plata for authority of courts to order release of prisoners. This is fascinating because this is another thing you touch in anticipatory defense in the alternative is the way I would present it, that they were deliberately indifferent even if they were acting in good faith. And the reason why you speak that is because there's going to be a presumption that they did, and maybe you're, you haven't understood that to provide evidence that they could not rely on good faith, as I've been trying to tell you to destroy that. But then you argue in the, in the alternative, even if they were acting in good faith, they were deliberately indifferent. The only way to establish that would be by their acts or by your record that you've created. And so this tells us, it guides us how we would... What we are anticipating in the habeas and what we may have to speak to, even though the burden's on the holder of you to present uh, their right and their warrant to do so. And their warrant in the health matter is extremely powerful, a very high burden uh, for you, uh, for easy for them to, to just make the statement, a little harder for you to kind of deny it, but not so hard in the regard that they're committing fraud. And we understand, I, I can say, I suppose, that fraud vitiates all acts and, and contracts. So once you throw this, the legal standard of fraud there, not the statement of fraud, but the, you prove to some level reasonable doubt or whatever the state says your standard is, preponderance of the evidence, once you establish that, now that burden just falls, the weight falls right onto the, onto the government to, over, to undo and you're standing there like a pit bull chewing on anything that they think that they can get out of their pockets. You're chewing their pockets, you're doing their legs, their pant legs, you're, you're, you're shredding everything they think they come out with a defense. All right, so you got a whole different dynamic. But that's uh, my thoughts. Uh, that's how I kind of look at this. I look at this in the future. I write the things I write to anticipate a dynamic. And then I prepare my mind on they're going to go there. What do I need to do in order to stop it? And I, it's not an opinion. You're working on strictly the facts or the lack of their uh, actions or the fact that they don't have no evidence and they're lying to the court to say they have it and all this other stuff. And you kind of get that in the rules of evidence of every state. You just go look through that for a little while. You can even do that in a cursory rules of evidence for the federal court. They're all they're kind of similar, not the same. They give you a good idea of what you're going to be hitting these guys with. Moving on now to the thing that really kind of astonished me about this and moving into that idea that you can be a pretty – Pretty gnarly uh, man or woman in, in prison, and, and they will release the, under COVID, under the myth of COVID, they'll release people into the society. I won't just talk about why that's happening, but just the, the fact of the habeas being available, even to prisoners, and how what you have to do to meet it is really what I'm talking about. What do we do to affect our remedies? We're not helpless, even though we think, think we are. We're all prisoners if we consider that we've been locked down. So this is actually applicable, notwithstanding my initial aversion 
Or the fact that when I read through this, I already know what I'm telling you, at least the one I'm pointing out to you. I know this is the things that what I meet, and these are just reconfirmed to me that that's proper to consider. Securing the release of people in custody in North Carolina during COVID pandemic was another article written by the same author. Oh, Ian A. Mance. Excuse me, I didn't identify that before. And uh, very interesting, near the very bottom of the article, he, uh, he, he talks about something that just uh, blew, kind of blew me away. The amount of stuff that goes through this COVID is fascinating. And uh, here's one of the statements near the end. Information about the, at the end, information about the Parole Commission's decision can also be difficult to come by. However, as of this writing, at least one person is known to have been released due to the advocacy of attorneys who raised questions about his vulnerability due to COVID-19. The man, given a life sentence in 1991 for second-degree murder, had previously been approved for a mutual agreement parole program contract by the commission and was otherwise scheduled to be released in 2021. Other attorneys are actively working to get more cases before the commission in the near future. Well, there it is, that your parole is a contract, it had mitigation value. It can be brought forward. Okay, so fascinating what the habeas can do for people to bring this thing up underneath even the illusion of a COVID-19 can do a thing. And so that's partly what I don't like to hear. It's being misused. But, you know, like I said, the government's so darn corrupt. Take the remedies where you can, I suppose. And if they had, in this case, they already figured the guy's going to go on parole, he's going to be on some kind of a, a contingency release on a contract, which is your parole is, your parole contract, then then so be it. I mean, what was the problem there? But here you see that even on life, that's <laughs> going to sentence to life, you would have a, a discussion as a prisoner. Now, what about those of you that are in your prison home and they, you don't have a, a life sentence, a state life sentence. Now, you have a life sentence when you were born, but you, that's not underneath the jurisdiction of the, of the government. The governmental life sentence for someone who's not actually supposed to be a prisoner is what you do. What you do, how you go, where you show, how you explain yourself, that you, even though you shouldn't have to. And I'd take that as another violation, given I wanted to move into those directions and depend on what I think I was going to be approached by as far as a response by the government. These things are available. You're not helpless. This remedy sits there to do. I've been telling to you for months. And even if you're a, a real a, a state prisoner, if you're if you're a, not supposed to be a state prisoner, find yourself a state prisoner. Uh, the big uh, story that came up uh, down the last week, right after the broadcast, well, I've been saying no one's doing the proper arguments. I'm going to hold to that. But here's an important insight. And it points to this one case that they've been, the governments have been using to bludgeon people since 1905. Part of the importance about this case. Federal court rules Pennsylvania's lockdown orders unconstitutional. And so I, when I saw federal court, I kind of, my eye kind of went squinty. And I said, okay, well, what, how'd they get that into the court? Well, you find out every other case found against the people, unless it was that remand that the judge found that they didn't invoke the federal authority, how did this judge take this case? And he does it a very interesting way, and so you have to understand that, and that's why I'm really only talking about it. It would, it was interesting this fact that he found that the restrictions were unconstitutional, and so I wanted, and I haven't had a chance to read the entire case, uh, but I read a bit, and he took it while challenging the 1905 Jacobson case. And so this is the, that's what got my interest in this case. Now, whether or not this stands, I don't know. But I want you to understand that when I saw a long time ago for medical conditions that they were using the 1905 Jacobson case, I took a note, a solid note of that. And the thing that they had, that, that co the court has handed the, the states to use till today was wrong, as far as I could tell, but it was almost, if you will, almost impregnable, impregnable what they would allow to the states for deference. And so discretion and deference come into part, and you have to speak to that. I've advocated that you do that where I've shown you find the black and white standard that they breached. And they couldn't come to a determination to give them the entitlement to the prerogative power that acknowledged in the state 
until you do so. And so this is a very interesting discussion. This federal judge calls that. He actually explains to us, and I think you need to read for this, he explains how since 1905 the Supreme Court has tried to shift this thing. They found violations over time in Jacobson, the absoluteness to it, which I have to say absolutely absolute, uh, absolute at the time, that those uh, contractions were really just done, they didn't, they didn't turn on a decision of the Supreme Court, so they were just objections to decisions. And he explains how this all works. He's taking up that gauntlet and challenging again, based on these dissents, that this, in this case, it's at this time, this has to be revisited in the way that he's decided. And so I find it very interesting in that regard. You need to see how they did this because it informs you on how you can speak to the state case without invoking federal law. If you look very carefully, this case speaks to a couple problems. And if you, I'll just read the very first paragraph, and you should be able to understand it, as I said it earlier, in a decision in just just issued by uh, County of Butler, ex, 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 al, et al. versus Governor Wolf et al., Judge William Stickman for, the fourth of the U.S. District Court of Western District of Pennsylvania has ruled that, one, the congregate limit gathering limits imposed by defendants' mitigation orders violate the right of assembly enshrined in the First Amendment, two, that the stay-at-home order and business closure components of the defense orders violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, and the three, the business closure components of the COVID orders violate the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. And so my problem is, you're looking at a federal right that gives you the exactions of every kind, and they can only give you exactions of every kind if they can justify it, but that's the limit. You have to have a decision made for that. You don't have your rights directly from the state constitution. So this is a this was a problem for me, and in looking at the purity of this case, uh, having to look through and then rely on a federal judge to throw it down underneath what you would what you see. You don't have your rights in the first instance either, do you? I mean, this is the main I think the main problem for me. But notwithstanding that, let's go to the opinion. Not a discussion about it. And he says, uh, William S. Stickman IV, United States District Judge. Remember, I've talked about the whether or not, uh, well, question, the legitimacy of the jurisdictions in the, in the districts, federal districts at all. And you see that over there at, what, Title 28, uh, Sections 81 to about 133, and whether or not they're Article Three courts. And if you go through the 14th Amendment, I suppose they're not. And I suppose they do have jurisdiction over 14th Amendment cases. In other words, you don't have your direct rights. You have these pseudo rights, the civil rights. They're the rights nonetheless, but they also they're also conditioned by obligation. It, it seems to be what everyone complains about, and no one wants to throw off. But moving into the opinion introduction, and this is where one of the problems was that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every aspect of American life. The COVID-19 pandemic is a problem statement, but let's say that could be stated in neutral, and it did, didn't it? So that's not really my problem here, but uh, since the novel coronavirus emerged in late 2019, governments throughout the world have grappled with how they can intervene in a manner that is effective to protect citizens from getting sick, and specifically how they can protect their health care (laughs) systems from being overwhelmed. That was long since gone, is it? Overwhelmed by an onslaught of cases, hindering their ability to treat patients suffering from COVID-19 or any other emergency condition. Let me just stop there. Enough failures. In this judge's order is fraud. The novel coronavirus emerged in late 2009 is not a factual statement. It may have presented as a fact, but it's a lie. There's no science to prove that. And so you see how a judge adopts the record that's made before him, and he failed in this case to look out and say, well, that hasn't actually been tested. I can't accept that. And then he relates the whole thing that patients were suffering from COVID-19 without stating that a COVID-19 is merely flu-like symptoms, which could be any sort of thing that causes flu-like symptoms. And so impliedly they're saying a coronavirus causes COVID-19 when there is absolutely zero proof in the FDA uh, test that they use will say that to you if you understand there's never been any isolates for that. Okay, so this is based on a record. This judge didn't look out and look at the take the judicial notice that he ought to in order to see that that's not even the case. 
and so you get the case you present. And so far, every case is not, well, not, I can't say every because I'm going to come to another case now, which may just change that and gone in the direction I told you. But uh, here we have a problem right in the opening discussion of the order as the parties pled it, and I say that's a problem. You're giving the power to the government. And he now had to go through the analysis of the case that is used by the governments to bludgeon you to death with, literally to death now, and that's the Jacobson case, and I'm going to give you a link to that to read, and I'm not going to read all, I'm just going to read an important part that's actually in the highlights of the PDF in the case summary or the case discussion. Uh, while a local regulation, even if based on the acknowledged police power of the state, must always yield in a case of conflict with the exercise by the general government of any power it possesses under the Constitution, the manner mode or manner of exercising its police power is wholly within the discretion of the state so long as the Constitution of the United States is not contravened or any right granted or secured thereby is not infringed or not exercised in such an arbitrary and oppressive manner as to justify the interference of the courts to prevent wrong and oppression. That is the club that the governments have been using, that provision right there. You heard that also in that Florida case, uh, the same sentiment is stated. And I was told you this is what you're going to have to show in battle. In fact, I want to ask you, and as I say, there is no spoon. The Matrix uh, says, uh, you know, you're looking at, there's, there's no spoon. What are you all involved in? There's nothing there. You can involve yourself with it, but it's not there actually. In the context of real life, someone's using something that there doesn't exist in order to hurt you. And the black and white said they didn't have that right. Now, the remedy is supposed to stop that. Now, well, how do you get at it? If the government is given, the general government is given all the power, how do you have an answer? It's in the exceptions here, and you have to learn to read for these exceptions, is what I've been telling you about and how to read these, so long as the Constitution of the United States is not contravened. This is a federal case, but it happens to be applicable to the state as well. As you heard, it's a state matter, public health crises. So as long as it doesn't, you know, the Constitution's not contravenes. What's the one of your missions then is to make the evidence of the contravention of the Constitution under which that authority is duty bound to to uh, administer. And this this is where that administrative aspect comes. This is a trust condition now. This is a trust crisis as well, not just a public health matter. And so if you bring your case and you don't argue a constitutional a contravention of the Constitution of the state, uh, depending on whether you want to go to the federal, I don't know, then your case is going to lose. Or any right granted or secured thereby is not infringed. So this is saying, and you're going to say there's a violation of the Constitution and you're going to bring what you've been harmed in, specifically, not by opinion, directly to you, the harms that this action has taken. Or here, and if you don't see an either, means and. When you read this, you see the constitutional contravention, or any right means and the right. You bring the constitutional protection to secure, to secure what right or property you were supposed to be secured in, together as a fact, in an affidavit that says it's been infringed in contravention. Uh, uh, thereby is not infringed. I even use the words. I didn't copy and paste this stuff. Or not exercised in such an arbitrary, arbitrary and oppressive manner. That is the administration. So that in all the alternative, if you give this power here, in the alternative, you would state the fact that this was grant. This was done arbitrarily and in an oppressive manner. And so what you're doing is you're stripping. The Jacobson Club from the hand of the government that they use. All these cases use this. It's pretty fast. I don't know why people haven't been commenting to it more often. I've been focused on the, the so fulfilling, well, the ability to, to disarm them with it. And so, just to let you know, and it just came up in a suggestion on how to how to put this together. You make a statement that's just the opposite of this. You state that the respondents in in your claim have contravened the Constitution, violating these certain rights, uh, referring to your affidavit uh, and properties, and they've infringed it. They've done, uh, and in the alternative, they've, uh, if they're given the, they haven't done it wrongly, they've exercised in an arbitrary and oppressive manner. Then you read, 
If it's, that hasn't been done, it doesn't justify interference of the court. When you do flip it over, it does then justify interference of the courts. And you put that right in your document because you're going to be having to address that when they come and try to use the Jacobson case. I, I felt pretty, I had to smile when I realized how clearly that, that, that point came out here recently that we're literally slapping the, slapping the, the, we're just arming the government right there. When you have a case that the evidence shows and comports itself to all the exceptions to that power, it's not an acknowledged police power prerogative, is it? And so this is what I've been talking about. It's right here in this case. I just wanted to touch on it since it's now become public knowledge. People, people see this as a problem, and I look, I've been looking for years at how these courts made limitations if you will, as I referred to savings clauses, these are the savings clauses relative to your rights and how you actually get them affected, how you over, overcome, as I said last week, dethroning the so, what appears sovereign. It's only sovereign as long as they can show evidence or the, the bar association member, which is a totally different problem, but sitting there, which you, uh, okay, you, I think you need to address it. It's kind of difficult to settle problem, but they're there. You can still trap that, but the, they will just going to go with the idea of this acknowledged prerogative power, and you have to strip that from them. And you do that not by saying so. You do that by the evidence you produce and the statements that, again, plug in the exceptions to that power as you find stated in this one case. Now, there, this is applicable to all other cases as well in, in other subject matters. And so now we're moving into where this may have for the first time been done, right after I talked about last week, uh, the, one of the section titles was A Partial Tyrant is Tyrant, uh, talking about Ohio's DeWine. It wasn't a day later or a day after that. A citizen's group files suit to end Governor DeWine's emergency COVID-19 orders. So where I told you if you a partial tyrant still a tyrant, someone was making a complaint about that. And here the important part of this, I'll give you a link. You can t listen and talk about it. Ohio stands up. I think that's a website. Uh, I have some links that you can read uh, to follow through what people are discussing about it. But the, but the point is I want to get you to the important point, which is what I've been saying all along. That's finally been done, whether or not it's executed that way, whether or not it's protected in that way, whether or not it's finally followed through in that way, uh, we'll have to see. But Ohio Stands Up files lawsuit to remove DeWine's COVID emergency orders uh, by the group that does it. I was going to read some of that. All you have to know is that it happened. You'll get the links later. And what I want to point out for this case, if you get the, and I've got a link to the uh, to the uh, complaint, it's all available through the through the links I'll give you. Was that they make the conversation, they talk about the fact in this case of what I read to you before in the FDA that they challenge the orders for the use because they use fraudulent science, they don't follow the law. And where it's shown, there is no isolates for the thing they say causes it. One, one thing of many that they're arguing is what I've been telling you needed to be done in the minimum. Challenge the basis for their orders in the foundation they claim is in this case. Why this one is very, very important. Why this one, depending on what they do, is very important important to follow. The problem I'm having with it is, I've understand here just near the few minutes before the broadcast, the, the attorney is focused on the discovery and what the attorney can get from discovery to expose the fraud. I think maybe more than actually somehow there's a problem with his focus on that, not using it as the continuum to get what he needs, but utilizing the 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 case to get discovery to disclose to y'all that it's not not a uh, not an opinion of the wrong. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that at all. I've told you to hit more direct. I've told you to allege the fraud and show that they couldn't come to the determinations. So you directly get at it. They've asked, I think, in this case for a jury trial. That's a potential problem because you're up now against the you're against the promotion of the government. And it's kind of like the, you know, this is just kind of like juries and, 
and, and, and believe in the court, believing the state is correct all the time. Anyway, I want to, this is an important case because it brings up the fraud. It brings up and challenges these orders for the fraud that I've told you you have to do. Whether or not they displaced Jacobson, I haven't read enough to read it. I've, there's just been too much. I've been doing too much right here to focus on. Uh, to, I've been focusing on other things that I can't do these. I did some precur uh, cursory work to look and see what these things were. The statement of fraud in this is what the important point is. How that will work out, I don't know because of the way they're running the case. And so here we go again about the question. And so, the guy I told you was a partial tyrant is still a tyrant. He gets a lawsuit put on his head a couple days ago. This is the universal problem is, uh, it, to be addressed is the Jacobson Club that they beat everybody to death with. And the way you do that is you assert the fraud. And you, it's going to take more, I think. And this is the thing that I've been working on. It's been taking a lot longer to lock down the anticipated defenses than it is the actual claim that they are proceeding without authority. or ju Actually, more importantly, jurisdiction. The health authority is without jurisdiction. And so I don't, I don't want to undermine anything that's good about this. I want to point out that there's, we're finally hearing at least one case that challenges the underlying basis for the orders, which is what has to be done. In the meantime, what came up was another story, and I read it. I thought it was important. Now we're seeing uh, a problem that it may not have been exactly the way it was first uh, reported, where the report I'll give you here is a Fox affiliate retracts a report alleging a cover-up of a low COVID case numbers tied to Nashville. The, it was first reported with emails that this was there was a cover-up going on with these numbers. What I found fascinating about this story is, okay, they say that the Fox affiliate retracts this story. They're promoting that the mayor was saying this is just fake news and the news regard the news people were irresponsible. But what I found interesting was the statement by the senior health official who essentially relies on COVID. And he says that this wasn't a citywide cover-up. I found that statement fascinating because this thing is actually, it's a global cover-up. Okay, it's a global cover-up. This thing's bigger. And he relates this thing to the COVID. And I think it, within the story, even if you retract this whole, this whole thing, even if those emails didn't mean it, though you can read a bit into that, the statement from the senior health advisor to the governor, or the senior advisor to the, to the mayor, stating that this is not a statewide cover-up, where they're referring to COVID-19, looked to me like another op, another information op. Because if they get you to believe that COVID-19 is something, and then it's retracted that there wasn't any cover-up, you don't believe there's a cover-up now. And in fact, it's covering the whole thing up because it's bigger. It's bigger than the, than the mayor that he's involved. And I want you to, this is like the, like the Chinese virologists. They, they make up a scenario and they then answer to that, and you think then everything is okay when the underlying thing is a fraud that they're talking to. And so I don't know what to say. It, it, it's a, again, The Matrix is not a movie. It was instructive. And uh, to, paint, to paint the city as a big cover-up that's a flatly untrue, this guy says, is untrue. The, the entirety is 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 a is a fraud and i would say that the answer to that is well where did this the mayor find and declare and determine the infectious agent has nothing to do with the emails now has nothing to do with the maybe even if it was improper it has to do with they're trying to sell the idea that there's not a cover-up all in one sentence not just the city the entire world and to get yourself free you're going to have to do a little bit of work to uncover that, even though what you're initially really responsive to is the fact of the failure to do the black and white that they were that the legislative uh, legislature 
delegated to the executive to do and they didn't do it. And that the consequence of that is your rights being violated, your property being violated, your ability to acquire property is violated. In any rate, so I, I don't know, my mind just goes, are you understanding what I'm saying? That they can have nose and nudist, nudist, I didn't mean that, uh, notice and news, and they can give you stories, and they're they're still a, they're still telling you a tale. They're still advancing the agenda, and it requires someone who has an insight of the foundation of that, and that should be every one of you, in order to be able to look right through that story and say, wait a minute now, <laughs> they just did this as a cover up to the broader cover up, to the broader fraud, to the broader destruction of society, whatever its origination, whether that is the United States itself, because remember we got a channel that goes through that that entices China to do what it did, or China itself, or the UN. And not one in the world uh, that uh, accepted COVID, denounced it, it is a global plan. And I don't want to diminish it by saying plandemic. It's not a demic at all. Okay? This is a crime against mankind. And so, I don't know what more to say right there. Uh, there is a structure been put in place. There has been the constraints on your rights and your remedies that you have to overcome. And it just occurred to me that you could characterize as hurdles, but as it was discussed to me in an email, in looking at these hurdles, they're actually instructing you of what your burden is as the plaintiff to overcome the presumption that the state's doing good for all the people. I don't look at them as as hurdles. I look at they are not not a look. They are the burdens. If you meet the burden of the plaintiff relative to the guidance given in the Jacobson case, you will set the case on a different footing. If you don't, you won't. And it's kind of that pretty much that simple. So move over here now. We started over Nashville. We'll stay in Tennessee for a minute. I'm going to move now. We're going to move into the, I told you, into the idea that this is all hindsight, Operation Hindsight 2020. I told you it was coming in. I showed you that it would be likely medical because that was the next way they could put the iteration, the worst control that 9-11 started. And this is why I don't rush too far. I can show you the international connections into the UN, but I don't rush too far to exonerate the United States. So we always hold these. I'm op these are all options of thoughts in my mind of how this thing is working. I answer, as I told you, if you think the worst and you answer to the worst, you've likely captured the less, the lesser of the problem. So let me move on to what happened They've forced this stuff in. Uh, you don't realize there's still this story running of 9-11. And what happened right after, it was all planned before, if you look close enough, that uh, more oppression came on you. And they facilitated the execution of this way back when. And then in the laws like the PATIOT Act and the, the, the other acts, I won't go through them. And part of my memory doesn't want to function there anyway to worry about it all. I know they're there. And they're working the Modernization Acts, all those things. They're all there setting up the future, If you, I told, as I told you. And so now we get this story, which is kind of, I guess, surprising to some people. But to confirm to you this thing I told you was going to be Op 2020, we're going to be exposed to things that have been set up all along that were implemented after the excuse called 9-11. 9-11 was COVID-19, okay? It's all this... Same fascination, sensationalism. Am I saying nobody's dying? That's not what I'm saying. So, kind of let's kind of keep up, folks. Keep up with what I'm where I'm at. There's real death going on, but that's that means they just don't care about you. And so we hear now inside your states and relative to Nashville, Tennessee. We're in Tennessee. Highway Patrol are employees of a Homeland Security which I didn't know, think that it was, I didn't understand this was a question, actually, when you see how the federalization of the government is and why I questioned what's really happening underneath Title 28, Section 81 to 133, when you see the district courts are really administrative districts. But the CIA World Factbook will tell you that the states were administrative districts, how a state government could be distinct and different, 
on one hand, on that loan, let alone there's also laws in the states that say when you take federal money, you follow federal policies. So there's no freedom of the states at some level. That's why I focused in on the stuff that they couldn't do, the savings clauses in particular, what I found out more and better about the mining law relative to property rights and their connection to patents and the grants and the relationships and the trusts and the breaches. We're not talking about statutory law now. We're talking about an internal obligation on the government that's forever upon it. And this is what I start looking for within all of these things I talk about. And they're there, which is fascinating. So the, your republic is there. It's, are you going to be responsive and protect yourself with it? And then understand you've got a, a, a couple of occupations happening that are in front of you with that. And you're going to have to figure out, we will, I think, as a society, have to finally come to terms with it. I told you COVID was going to give us that impetus. I've been disappointed we haven't moved in the direction. It's still there to do. But uh, here, what's, this, what's the surprise relative to Tennessee Highway Patrol or employees of Homeland Security? It, the veneer that the 9-11 put on us was another, on, another veneer on top of it all underneath the excuse of national security. Uh, but here's a story you might want to understand for Tennessee. When, uh, and again, it's for those of you that are interested to start seeing the layers of a control that have been built in and uh, they may or may not have an effect on what you want to do. In fact, they can actually divorce. They can actually, if, if you pay attention, they they can move themselves from relevance. Actually, if you can prove that this is the case relative to any jurisdiction that the law enforcement may have as well. And so you got to just be an open mind to what goes on and step back and analyze things a little. Take a little bit more time. Stop saying you got rights and start to understand how they stole them all from you. And then what to do about it. But when a Tennessee uh, Highway Patrol trooper ripped the mask off a man who was a, has a, was video recording a traffic stop last week, I thought it was just another case of police abusing, a, abusing his authority. But this story was about to get a lot more interesting. Four days ago, WKRN reported that the Highway, Highway Patrol trooper had been fired for his actions, which is not the disturbing part. Well, that's kind of interesting. He would be just, uh, congratulations, uh, Tennessee. Uh, you know, right off of the surface, on the surface, that's kind of cool. That's not the disturbing part. No, it wouldn't be if he was actually been held account, would it? So this is all, uh, this, this uh, sentence was kind of funny to me in a way. But the disturbing part now, uh, who fired him and what it reveals about the feds controlling law enforcement? After, fi after filing a complaint with the Office of Professional Accountability, Homeland Security made this announcement. So here's a complaint, and here's the response by Homeland Security. This is showing you there's a process by getting uh, information back. Uh, and they, their quote is, it is a Department of, of Safety and Homeland Security policy to warn, suspend, demote, or dismiss any employee whenever just or legal cause exists. Employees shall not commit any act that would reflect discredit upon themselves or the department while on or off duty. And so I'll leave that right there. Uh, you can now see the veneer of authority that runs your states in its police, in at least Tennessee's police departments. That would need to be qualified a little bit more. But I would say this is going to be a generic veneer. I don't see how people miss this at all, why this is even a surprise. But the this is the effect of what started at 9-11. That control, whether you see a state trooper or not, that federal control is now busting in your doors. So understand this dimension relative to the so-called homeland security nonsense that they put on this and where this ends up going, and it has to be military in its enforcement, whatever they look like to you. DHS agencies are taking millions in cash from travelers every year, can't be bothered to stop any crimes. Well, if you extend that to those troopers, even though they fired, what if there's a law that provided for them to steal from you and they're doing so and you think it's the state and you can't get remedy because national security is trumping everything you do? Why? Because of the Jacobson idea concepting that the prerogative sits in the government to do so. And it's up to us. One of the avenues is to show a doubt, at least enough doubt, that causes the question and maybe gives you the discovery rights as one, a judge, as one attorney is attempting to do. In little over 15 years, DHS agencies interacted with millions of travelers passing through our nation's airports and relieved them of two billion, it's B, bravo, two bravo 
billion in cash. <laughs> Can you believe this, folks? I mean, I, just, I can't believe when I see these values. They're just beyond me. That, that a government would do this against people underneath a fraud, and yet I speak about how that is all the time. It doesn't mean I still believe it. I know it's happening. I just can't believe it. I, mean, I can't believe we all, we all kind of let that happen. And remember, they say nation's airports. The infiltration now we hear is into, at least from the federal end, down into trains and, and any other mode of transportation. And also now we hear that the troopers are enforcing these tr federal transportation laws as well, are employ employees of the DHS themselves. Yeah, so I just wanted to point out here, the DH, DHS is, is enforcing these, these takings, these thefts, uh, underneath the color of another, uh, like a COVID, and they're, they're taking your, your, your livelihood and your, and your hard work in the form of uh, property and money, uh, and it uh, uh, doesn't stop crime one, and yet they get the ability to do it, it, is another avenue of things that should be wrong that somebody wants to stop and starts to formulate the idea on how they're going to go do it. As we move into the fact that though they do that, in Michigan at least now, finally, as I don't understand why these cases take so long to even come to bear, but here they are. Michigan Supreme Court says, notwithstanding that they steal from you, uh, selling a $24,000 house and keeping the proceeds uh, over an $8.41 debt is unlawful. Do I need to say more? I mean, I just can't even get this one. But at any rate, so now, in Michigan at least, you can't, even though the laws are not, don't say this, the laws say that when there's a sale, and I'm not justifying the sale, the tax sale, the, the sale goes on, the, the county takes the property, they're supposed to sell, the, I haven't found any other statutes that say different. They sell the property, they give you, they pay their obligation to the, your obligation to the tax from the proceeds, and they hand you the rest. That's in the law. Where these people get the idea they can keep it, I don't even know. How this has gone on, I don't even know, except the Bar Association and the legal profession and the legal professionals are promoting sustainable development. And you scoff and you roll your eyes and you say, well, go look at Article 7 and you tell me if that's not what's going on. Go look at how they treat everything administratively and you tell me whether or not in an administrative sense you have any property rights. If you don't have property rights, they don't have to give you the due process you thought. What was the main thing about Jacobson? And the thing, and the addition of the conditions was due process. I told you that's maybe the last thing you have. What have I said behind the woodshed that you do? You point out the failure to follow the duty is a due process violation. And because they failed that, they violate the Constitution, which says due process would protect you. As one angle of protection through that one little statute imposing the legislative legislature imposing the duty to determine an infectious agent. So, Michigan finally says they step up, finally, under civil asset forfeiture, you can't just take this stuff and not hand people their money back. This was a civil asset forfeiture. It wasn't, you see what they're doing now under taxes, okay? They can't do it. And yet they have been. And I don't understand where people are that they've been allowing it. And, and now we take 2020 and we're finally finding, oh, no, these governments are not supposed to do that. What's hidden in these cases is if you're as a tax property, it's a tax property, they've mischaracterized, fraudulently characterized your property as a marketable property in commerce. And yet there's a patent underneath it, not in file with the BLM likely or your local land, your land department from the federal government. Everybody who's been talking about people saying that you make your own patent, it doesn't know, just stop listening to them. These patents are already issued. They're already there in the government records. You just go find the one that's pertinent to your property and make your proof of the chain to you as the assignee. Now, I'm not going to get past into that. Point is that that's looking all past that. They are, are stealing your property, and they're doing it on taxes that are mischaracterizing your property as something other than patent land. I've told you, one state says that no judiciary has authority, they don't have jurisdiction to determine or change the, the effect of a patent. That would mean to the assignee. You can't change that. It means they have no jurisdiction over a, an event evidence patent land. Does that stop them? No, because they treat you as some slave and an occupied people. And there's not enough people that understand this to stop it being uh, oh, conspiracy theories and run right into what I've been telling you folks for eight or so months about how you stop this fraud called COVID. 
it, it's really all the same stuff. Anyway, so moving on, I get kind of I start to feel myself. I am getting irritated. They're not supposed to do this stuff, and until someone properly puts it forward, they do it. It's not a land of the free. It's not a presumption of law over action. It's a presumption of an acknowledged prerogative power in those that come under the color and costume of government. It's what COVID is. Is everything else it does wrong. And that's why I'm Part of me wants to get excited. If you could just see that, you'd realize how we've been done dirt. And maybe we could get at the problem. Until you do, everything's a big problem. Everything's an injustice. It is an injustice, so stop whining about it. How are we going to fix that? COVID opera offers us the ability to get our mu flex our muscles a little bit back in something that we should be able to win on ultimately, especially when lots and lots more of us come. Look how excited everybody got in Ohio well, because, oh, they actually challenged the, they actually challenged for fraud their orders. What have I been saying all this time? Why has it taken this many months? Why is an attorney put on a pedestal? And yet, go for it. Do it. Congratulations. Somebody said it. Now, I suspect that's going to be coming along more. And I was... Uh, not that I want to push it too fast. I was a little disappointed not to be hearing one of my listeners come out first. But as you get involved, you realize it's more involved. And it takes a little bit of time to set up, at least to anticipate what you think is correct. And I don't say that as a question. You do your best to make it correct. We don't know the, the future. So we don't know the interference. So that's why you can't predict that as absolute. All you can do is point to the black and white beyond your opinion and say that wasn't followed, and that ought to be good enough. But because it's not, here's some more stuff we're going to talk about, and then, then we're going to now, now we're going to get ready to go hand to hand because that's where we are in the battlefield called the court. With a bar member sitting there that wants to take away your rights and promote sustainable development, just as all the health documents say they're supposed to, if you haven't figured that one out as well. So, uh, they take your property. If they have the right to take, they can only take as much as they need to pay back. They can't take the whole property, at least in Michigan. I know that's everywhere. It's just that there's no, you see no reflection of justice, and no reflection of the law in any other state in very many places. And that's why we're having these times. And it's because I think we have an ignorant popula, completely ignorant a population. For all that I hear, all the vociferousness I hear about all the rights you has, not one of you knows how to enforce the right, and not one of you understands how difficult it is because you're in another occupation that you haven't figured out to call out, and not all of us are working together when we see that to help each other. And then we get impressed by things like Black Lives Matter and like there is a, some kind of a, a, a war going on. Well, I can't imagine how small those are actually are relative to the people of the, of the United States, let alone Someone was asking me, what about, the, you know, commenting about a civil war, thinking it's coming and this and that. I said, I don't know that this doesn't come down like the historic civil war. I think you're already in the war. It's not a civil war. They call it a civil war. They want you to think it's going to look like a civil war. The government wants you to think it's going to be a civil war. What this is, is what you're already in. It's a social war. It's an economic war, ultimately, but this is a social war. So you're going to either fight with each other and let them win because you're not focused on what you have and lose the social war, or you're going to say, this is a social war. We don't. There's no, no purpose in it. We have bigger, better things to do, and we need to get back to those bigger and better things, and here are the obstacles to that, and we're going to work to take them down. We're going to alter and abolish this thing that's come up around us that ought never have been done, as I was excited to hear the Virginia Second Amendment. They even said that wrong. I think, what was it? Is it their Article 13 or something? Anyway, their Right to Bear Arms Amendment in the state. Underneath another color of a fraud, if you will, in law, the sanctuary counties. And I showed you exactly what the Constitution said needed to be done. And what they've done, they've done is just like I've suggested, they offer you this thing. Oh, it was a virologist SARS CoV 2. Here's a here's COVID 19 from a virologist, no less. Must be, must be real. It's all show. And we don't focus in on where, where we think, and maybe that's a little 
you want to say arrogant on my part to think we're not focusing right, but I've pointed it out to you in black and white, so I don't know what else to say the adjective would be for what I do. I pointed out it was a better and cleaner answer, and this is the same thing. The, I told you, when I come out of the sanctuary county in Virginia, I said, that was a model for this of what's coming up. We have the example of what we have to do. Maladministration, we get to alter or abolish as the people see fit. You just have to be unified to say that. At any rate, that's, uh, I don't know. I, I, think, I see an answer if we would stop complaining and stop shrugging our shoulders and turning our w away uh, like we can't really do anything. If you're going to say that, then nothing's going to happen. It makes That's pretty self-evident. And so where are we going with this? Despite You see, Michigan says they can only take so much, and there is a limit to the extortion that they can do when you, understand, you don't understand completely what's going on and they don't make a comment to it. Like I'm talking here, what am I talking about? The property, taxation of property, and the patent sits there and says forever you're separate? What? Wait a minute. How, how does that, how do you commingle my property with something that you had an obligation to protect in me? The land is not the same as a mortgage document that I sign. That's a different uh, liability. It's not the same as a fraud that mischaracterizing my land is marketable instead of patent. That's not my liability. That's your fraud. That your system won't recognize that as just a corruption and a breach of our establishment, which we have to alter and abolish. So I get there pretty quick again. But futuristic data policing, policing program in her, is harassing Pasco County families. As you see DHS rolling out and we see the comprehensive surveillance going through, and we, this is why, and we see now Tennessee troopers involved. We get down to Pasco County. And we find out they're using this uh, software. Pasco Sheriff created a futuristic program to stop crime before it happens. Now, I had a, a few in, insights and questions, really. How, how, if it's before it happens, what's your, what's your warrant to get the, to go in and bust people's houses as you keep trying to isolate people and cause four, 12 to 14 year old junior, junior high schoolers and mid schoolers to be presumed to live a life of crime that will forever in their lives have to be harassed and potentially shot dead because of the power that you've allowed the government using artificial intelligence. Uh, this was a really a telling story. Weeks ago it came up. I don't know what people find important. I'm going to tell you this is the extension of the federal starting of 9-11, where they're going to track and trace everything. You listen to it here. It's supposed to be invented by the local sheriff there. I mean, air quotes, you get that. Utilizing a system that he figured out would help. And he's got all the good words and the warm and fuzzies on how it helps. And yet when you look at the what's happening, there's no basis for what they've done. And they're keeping data on you and making determinations that they claim one of their detectives looks over And yet you hear what they do relative to that oversight is still wrong. If it's pre-crime, what was the warrant for the crime? That they're stopping and, and harassing you, threatening you, busting in your house with SWAT teams over. Is your future. If you don't stop it now. And it, again, this COVID, where you can destroy the acknowledged prerogative power by exposing the government wasn't honest and didn't intend to be. You start to now make a quick inroad that it, it, it is not entitled to the presumptions of honesty or trust that it or confidence that is bestowed upon it. That is our problem. Maybe even some of you don't understand that. That's our problem. This is what the occupiers have given to themselves. It comes under the phrase national security if we go to federal. That gives them the supposed license. And so we hear all the news about how all that imposition that we put on us under the cause they were telling us like WMD was fraud, but no one stepped up and said that was fraud and flipped the burden that we now see Jacobson created that can be flipped over on them. And COVID is a lot less threatening because it's a lot easier to show that the local agency Public Health Authority was derelict in its in its execution of what the legislative branch 
enacted. What am I talking that way for? Separation of powers problem on top of it all. Not a federal one, a state one. Republican form representative governments destroyed. These just words? No, uh, could be. But if you tie them to an obligation through the organic documents of your state, they're not. They're actually something now. And not because they're your opinion or because, oh, look how intelligent, com constitutional I sound because I can spew them. Well, that, that irritates me to no end. People spewing stuff and you realize they don't even know the first thing. When it comes down to applying it all, they don't know the first thing about utilizing any of it. Black Lives Matter. Mobs around home. Police report arrest of man brandishing gun. Man in his house being threatened by a mob outside at night. They say he's brandishing a gun. The video I saw didn't look like brandishing to me, so this means you never need to necessarily go look and see in your state what brandishing is. As I've said, you don't point the gun at anybody. Doesn't mean you can't show it, and that's what he intentionally does. Guess what? The mob calls him out for standing in his house and I never saw the gun pointed at anybody. I saw it up. It, was a, it looks like a shotgun. And he, the cops come and arrest him away from his house, leaving his house vulnerable. Reminded me of what they're doing to South Africans and the boar and the farmers. You have a Second Amendment right, but you start to you need it because of the mob outside, and now you get hauled away is an extension of the condition that you're an occupied people and the ones with the guns are the more dangerous than the mob that can hurt you because they need the system needs the mob to keep you in threat to expose those of you that would protect yourself why i've said be, be not cognizant of what you're brandishing and or uh, assault with a gun or deadly weapon laws your use of force statutes are in your state that's your black and white and if you have no concept of it, you're going to be this guy. You may be this guy anyway, but at least you'll have a word in your mouth on how they did it wrong and become the vast mass of people that have their rights violated. And you can get it from the taxpayer, this guy himself who pays property tax in order to get your money back for the violation. The cops are too stupid and too, too untrustworthy and in breach of their oath actually to give you the benefit of the doubt and break up the mob in the street. But this is your future. This is what they want. This is what they created Black Lives Matter for. Retired cop gets a dose of his police state as cops raid wrong home, holds his family at gunpoint. What did I say about the Pasco stuff? Here's a, a different aspect. Wrong warrant, no warrant, no house. And they break in because they just think so. Likely because he's an ex-cop, they fixed his door. How many stories have you heard they blow the houses up and then they don't? So once you're out, you're just subject to their authority. And this is why I keep saying, you keep hearing these stories, you better start getting involved where you're going to make a policy with the local enforcement. They don't do this no more. And then if you have a, you can get to your local council, if they're listening and they're not part of the agenda, maybe you're going to be able to get some checks and balances in this so they don't do this carte blanche, just walk in, start putting everybody underneath the gun when they don't actually have a warrant. There has to be some private liability put on these people. You can't do it underneath the current uh, paradigm, which doesn't provide for that. So this is legislation. The local authorities can do that locally, for each one of their employees as well. Remember, you're dealing with employees here as well. They're called officers. They're incorporated. There's a whole other dynamic going on. So we can go through the story, but this is where a cop, ex-cop, has this door kicked in, and it's a wrong house. Nobody's safe. He gets his door fixed, though, in places where I haven't heard other people get their door fixed. And who? what if it would have went worse? like we hear so many stories. And this is where the cops were told they had the wrong house. They're not listening to you. They don't care about you. Reminds me now as a quick little thing in a video I saw somebody doing something with a mask and a COVID. Would I tell you about making a letter and having it in your pocket? 
when the cops ask you to put a mask. And when you have your letter put in, you get to whip that out and say, this is under administrative review. This is administrative notice, and they don't have an answer that you're asking me for something that's unlawful, notwithstanding what you think. And you give yourself a footing now to discuss, the if there's a discussion, or to avoid being hauled off, as I saw. It just a, I don't have the story, I don't remember now, just a glimpse of a quick video. I don't even know if I saw the whole thing. In a way, it disgusts me uh, to see it, and I don't want to look at it anymore. On the other hand, we're in the time we're told of the kind of condition we live, and we don't create even a, the minimalist piece of barrier, we're asking for this ourselves. And those of us that are out and about that are putting ourselves a little bit even more into potential harm's way, those of you not listen, they're doing that and not listening to the common sense, and I don't mean the real common sense, not the one they want to make common community sense. I mean your horse sense. To have something in your mouth, and really in a written piece of paper, that you can produce and have a, change the subject matter when you could be thrown into something and utilize it and walk right into the buzzsaw of their prerogative, acknowledged prerogative power without the protections of the Jacobson exceptions, even. I don't know what I don't want to. I want to call. I want to say names, but that it's not even that good. It's calling people names. I guess I don't have to do that. I could say you're being foolish, at least in the minimum. And, and so, and I'm, I'm, I get. I start thinking about that, and it bothers me a lot because we have a way to stop all this nonsense if we would just all start doing it. And it's not going to stop at all, but it's going to be a message that starts to be sent back to the system. And you definitely have to send that back, because right now they have no limitation. And so that's why it's so exciting to see an attorney, oh, the champion attorney, the bar is the same one that brings you into the problem. Oh, we're going to have one stand up, and we're actually better, we better show that we're at least challenging this thing for fraud. Let's throw one to the wolves here and see how that works. You all should have been doing that. You all didn't need an attorney to do that. But no, we're so incapacitated I mean, I don't, again, I get, and so to, to watch people confronted by cops over stupid mask issues and not have a better word in your mouth than, oh, yeah, uh, is not going to cut it. I'm telling you, and you have an evidence of that, and, it, and you should be sending the word out like fire here, the fire alarm on how you're supposed to do a lot better, and it's there to do better. And so what have I been talking about? Challenging the authorities, various jurisdictions, the authorities underneath the jurisdiction, you challenge that. We have an evidence that it goes to the highest uh, potential. I don't know where this is going to go, but I just wanted to use it as an evidence of what people can do, even though this is going through the legislature. Something started a movement in people that made it official. And like I said, I don't know the ramifications of this because of the international contract and agreement and reservation that the Queen has, but Barbados quit Commonwealth and removes Queen as sovereign was a pretty interesting headline. And so let me just touch that. What I say last week, dethroning what appears sovereign, kind of speaks to this. You have to step up and you have to take action. And how I've been explaining for decades how to begin to approach that. And again, every, every situation can dictate to you the requirements. But here's where a people stand up and say, you're not a sovereign. And this is what you're doing in COVID to write your first letter. I mean, really, I, I couldn't be, I smiled, a big smile when I saw a simple little note paper, notepad paper, three block paragraph statement, handwritten to a health authority, a parent health authority, requiring how, asking how did they make this determination relative to the fact there is no test. I just smiled. That's it. That's all this thing hinges on. And I can't get but now one person to do that is really, can I say pathetic? So here it is, another the queen now of the commonwealth. You see, these people are not underneath their own. They're not underneath their own head of state, and they know that. In a big announcement this week, I'd say so big. That's an understatement. The Caribbean nation of Barbados is planning to ju to walk out of the Commonwealth and remove Queen Elizabeth II as the head of state. 
Now, understand these are very specific terms, so I'm not sure the, the extent of this, and I'm not sure what's going to happen on how they ameliorate this thing. The queen is the, quote, constitutional monarch of Barbados since her independence on 30 November 1966. How many years has been going on, right? As the sovereign, she is the personal embodiment of the Barbar Barbadian crown. I'm just thinking, and name John, uh, I can't remember your name, uh, used to listen. I don't know if you're still listening. I think you live in Barbados, have a little store or something back there. Uh, maybe get in touch with me to say hi. But uh, Yeah, so you're living underneath that. Barbados walks out of Commonwealth. Barbados Governor General Sandra Mason gave a speech on Tuesday at the state opening of Parliament explaining that, quote, the time has come to fully leave our colonial past behind. Mason, reading from the speech written by Barbados Prime Minister Mia Modley, said that the plan is for the country to become a republic, and then it could uh, happen as early as November 2021, which would coincide with the 55, 55th anniversary of when Barbados gained independence in 1966. Well, I don't think it's an independence if it's a monarchy, a constitutional monarchy. So, very interesting, though. This is, I think, beyond big. How the governor general is saying that tells you that is, I don't under, understand how that office is not beholden to the queen, but there's something going on here that's very interesting to me that I I wanted to point out. Here's some people, anyways, that is standing up to the so-called sovereign prerogative, as I told you last week. And I've laid out today, again, more elements on how you do that. As we talked about in Virginia back before COVID, on it's in the people already in the Constitution to do these things. You don't have to make such a big announcement. You just show how the the, the malfeasance, nonfeasance, misfeasance, the, non, the maladministration goes on, and you, as a people, have the right to alter and abolish it. You have to show these these harms. You do something similar, I guess, as was exampled in one time to an organic document, the Declaration of Independence. You don't do the independence. You do the you, you move to alter or abolish the harm that's built up inside the system the Constitution did not protect. And the institutions, having the obligation and duty, did not protect. In a way, I get kind of excited to hear that. We have the power. Why are we still locked down under a fraud? Why do we have to put up with such nonsense? How are our countrymen and women in such a de debilitated state by this? And how dis mentally dysfunctional are we as a people, globally anyway, let alone locally? You have the power to stand up. You have the power once you find out there's a problem to stand up. Independence apparently didn't meet a non-monarchy, constitutional monarchy in Barbados. So that wasn't so independent. Remember, independent, not non-dependent. So, we got evidence all at the same time of what's going on. You want to challenge this acknowledged prerogative that the prerogative power, police power that we hear Jacobson since 1905 has been, the governments have been willing to beat you about, beat you into submission, or are you going to finally say, no, time has come to straighten that up? And the only way to do that is to take action in the proper way, as I've said, give yourself the basis. It's not based on an opinion, it's based on the facts you can develop. And objectively so on that. Yes, there's some. There's a little bit of reading. Yes, you're going to have to read. Yes, you're going to have to understand. You're going to have to comprehend. You're going to have to think a lot better, a lot more clearer than I think I've ever seen many people be able to do. For as brilliant as I watch and hear people exposing things, none will take that uh, that high awareness. And I don't mean high. Yeah, maybe I do. Maybe that's how you get that. Although I don't partake, so I don't know. At any rate, so the... Awareness that's required in order to observe this and then take action apparently is not in our people. And that's pretty, well, it's disturbing on one level, but it's quite amazing for me to notice of all the high-sounding people that will speak of their insight and all their protections in the Constitution and all this stuff, or even the how it doesn't work and still not take action to protect themselves. See, I don't, the whole entire thing has fallen as far as I can see. And it's just now, it's kind of neat, just now we're going to make a hero out of a, a, a bar member that actually put us here. He may not have, his association has. 
and to put him on a pedestal because what did he do? He just said, wait a minute, the emperor wears no clothes, and you can't get the cloth to make any clothes, and you don't even know how to sew. Because there is no test, and there is no isolate, and there is no way for you to say that this thing you're relying on even exists. And when you didn't do that, you brought the country vulnerable in its economic and societal constraints and rights, and, and then, then you interfered with their ability to know what the enemy was so that they could actually fight it. You've hobbled everybody by this. And nobody could say that? Well, hopefully it's coming along, it's going to be said, but taking so many months to get here, and it didn't take that it shouldn't have been that much and that hard. Especially with all the people I know that have ever, in the last 30 years I've known, 40 years I've been doing this, have known that people who know how to get in the courts, and they haven't been the first to also to step up with this new awareness and how to actually get better results, to get more people to know, to actually bring the proper focus in. It's pretty astonishing what we walk away from. Moving into where this 9-11 thing goes and that there's a limit. Appeals court rules NSA bulk phone data collection illegal. The Federal Appeals Court Wednesday ruled the National Security Agency NSA surveillance program of that data collected data on America's telephone calls was illegal and possibly unconstitutional. And this is where they you see the hesitation possibly instead of making the decision. This is where they they fail us. A three-judge panel in Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the program, which was revealed by whistleblower Edward Snowden and officially ended in 2015, violated U.S. surveillance laws, potentially the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. Again, potentially. However, look how many years that the government did the violation shows you you're not a you're under a false presumption that you can trust the government, a false presumption that they have acknowledged that they're entitled to this prerogative power. Uh, and yet, they even with constraints, they'll violate it. How many years it's taken to get that answer? It should be a pa fact packet that you'd put together to start arguing, at least if it's an argument, that the government does not deserve the acknowledged police power prerogative that a case like Jacobson, Jacobson would extend to it at least any more. We're in a new day. We need new protections, and we need it from a judiciary that's not going to impose a foreign agenda, but going to do the do the law the way it was supposed to do, uh, for, require due, proper due process, lawful due process, not just what they call a hearing, lawful due process with lawful conditions that allow for the justice to be done, because it's not. And so there's this oppression, and yet you see the limits, and we need to rise into that those limits, as I've explained today. Even looking at the big nasty club that the government used through the Jacobson case that was referred to in, in the federal court case that shows that even now a judge, this, the idea is that, that Jacobson was too strict on how it uh, gave the governments the, the prerogative that it didn't challenge that and that there hasn't been a challenge and I think he wanted to be maybe one that makes a record for that I think you don't have to answer that as a question you assert that as the fact thank you Grimner for what you do at reallibertymedia.com in the place in the broadcaster and the archives for all y'all and then a speaker where we go and Grammy Mary, thank you for donating to that all the time to keep us and gets us over to the YouTube that kind of strikes us. We got banned here last week until they found out that I wasn't contrary to the who, so contradictory in uh, UCY.TV. Thank you. Sound mind, normalization of ignorance, just in case I see you around, not see you much, but uh, thank you for the, your support here and there. Cowboy Tech on the mines, Grimner, what you do there, mines, and, uh, and then the bit shoot, appreciate all that. I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>